DRPS investigating an alleged shooting in Uxbridge. Dan Kearns, The Standard, Uxbridge. Durham Regional Police, DRPS, seeks the public's help following a reported shooting in Uxbridge. According to the DRPS, on Friday, October 30th, at around 3 p.m., members from North Division were dispatched to an unknown trouble call in the area of Davis Drive and Lake Ridge Road. Officers arrived on scene and located one male suffering from a gunshot wound. The male was taken to a Toronto area trauma center with serious but non-life-threatening injuries. It is believed the unknown suspects fled the area in a vehicle and were last seen westbound on Davis Drive toward Main Street, a DRPS press release explained. Police are appealing to any members of the public who may have witnessed the shooting or who have cell phones or surveillance video to call Detective Constable Bukaboom of the North Division Criminal Investigation Bureau at 1-888-579-1520, extension 2696. Anonymous information can also be provided to Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-8477. Outgoing Kawartha Lakes Council members make final goodbye speeches. Dan Kearns, The Standard, Kawartha Lakes. With last month's municipal elections now over, it is clear who will serve on the next City of Kawartha Lakes Council. At the last meeting of the current council term on Tuesday, November 1st, outgoing members of council had a chance to say their goodbyes. Mayor Andy Letham, one of the members who decided not to run for re-election this time, was the first to make a speech. I just want to say thank you for your support and your friendship. It's much appreciated, your confidence in allowing me to be your mayor. I do believe we're leaving the municipality better than we found it, he said with the emotion clear in his voice. Mayor Letham noted one of Council's previous term's accomplishments when Council decided to reduce their composition to nine members. I went to conferences in Ontario, and other mayors would come up to me. I'd tell them what we did, and they literally said, You did what? We can't even get our Council to have that conversation about good government, good business, streamlining what you need to do as a government. So kudos to you who are here and those who were here previously. Ward 2 Councillor Kathleen Seymour Fagan, who finished third in this past election's mayoral race, praised city staff for their help during her time on council. I never thought I'd learn so much about roads and potholes and how to gently tell people there's not a lot we can do about things. Staff have been integral in assisting councillors on their job because we couldn't do our job without the staff. We also couldn't do our job without other councillors helping each other, she stated. So, in the new term of council, I hope everybody can work together just as well as we have. Ward 5 Councillor Pat Dunn, who finished second in the mayoral race, called his experience as a councillor fun, educational, and enjoyable. I look forward to my next adventure, he added. Ward 4 Councillor Andrew Veal, who did not run in the municipal election, talked about what he'll miss most about his job. I will miss the meetings with constituents and staff over various issues or items, he explained. I always learn something from them. Lastly, outgoing Ward 7 Councillor Pat O'Reilly said, It was a pleasure working with the Mayor, CAO Ron Taylor, and staff members, and he was thankful for the wonderful years working as a member of Kawartha Lakes Council. CUPE workers hit the picket line in a province-wide strike. Dan Kearns, The Standard. North Durham, Kawartha. Many schools were closed across Ontario on Friday, November 4th, as Ontario employees, represented by the Canadian Union of Public Employees, CUPE, hit the picket line. After failed mediation talks between provincial officials and those from CUPE, the Ontario government decided to pass legislation to impose a four-year collective agreement with CUPE's workers. The provincially created deal sees a salary increase of 2.5% for workers who make below $43,000 annually and a 1.5% increase for employees above the $43,000 mark. The Ontario government used the notwithstanding clause to fast-track this legislation through. This clause allows governments to override any Canadian charter challenges for a five-year period. QP workers include secretaries, clerks, technicians, custodial and maintenance staff, and educational assistance. However, 
In a recent statement, Fred Hahn, president of CUPE Ontario, said regardless of what this government does, we will be engaging in a province-wide political protest where no CUPE education worker will be on the job until we get a real deal. CUPE workers were joined by members of the Ontario Public Service Employees Union, OPSU, on the picket line. Bill 28 isn't just an attack on education workers' collective bargaining rights. It's an attack on all workers' rights. And after hearing from hundreds of our education workers and their local leaders who want to support their CUPE colleagues, our response to this unprecedented legislative overstep is clear. OPSU CEFPO education workers will walk out in solidarity with their QP colleagues this Friday. Read a press release from OPSU. The Durham District School Board, DDSB, and the Trillium Lakelands District School Board, TLDSB, both decided to close schools on Friday. Without our QP staff, we cannot safely operate TLDSB schools for students. TLDSB Director for Education Wes Hahn wrote in a message to parents. However, his message added schools would remain open to administrators, designated early childhood educators, teachers, and non-striking staff. In a statement posted on Thursday, November 3rd, the DDSB stated they would be closing schools to protect the health and safety of students, and admitted they did not know how long this labor disruption will last. On November 4th, Ontario Education Minister Stephen Leachy put out a statement which said the government had filed a submission to the Ontario Labour Relations Board in response to CUPE's illegal strike action. Nothing matters more right now than getting all students back in the classroom, and we will use every tool available to us to do so, his statement added. The Witness of Scars This week's issue is about Remembrance Day, Veterans Day, Indigenous Veterans Day, and all the other sacrifices we are indebted to so our society may thrive and grow. This, from the soil of beliefs our war veterans were defending when they went to war. But have we honored these sacrifices? If we have continued to live and even grow deeper in the values their actions were predicated on, then we have and are living in honor. If we, as a society, have departed from these values worth dying to protect, then where is the honor? I'd like to examine the idea of scars. What is a scar? Isn't it a remembrance, a witness, the substance of a truth? They reveal a reality most of us can never comprehend, especially not on an intimate level, internally. If I may, I believe I can safely say, no veteran would want us to carry around in our inner selves the scars they carry. How many times have you looked at someone, seen their scars, and then turned away, or wanted to? How many times have we felt secret shame when we have done this? Whenever I was confronted with the scars of others in the past, I had an aversion to the people who carried them. If they were war wounds, this confronted the inner sense I had of never doing my part or that I couldn't relate, making it seem I was not enough. I simply didn't know how to interact with these individuals. What if I asked a question which set them off or sent them into a recurring cycle of traumatic memories? Frankly. I was intimidated and afraid. Then one day I realized, how did they feel going to war to protect us and the values which protect life? Who was I to allow this little bit of insecurity to override the depth of reality these brave people have lived, openly lived, to defend our lives? These heroes deserve time with us, but time which illustrates their sacrifices were not for nothing. Time which imparts back to them gratefulness, purpose, and security for the kind of future they gave of themselves to defend. Part of the disconnect is because we have never really experienced this kind of raw reality, or have confronted the worst of the potential of mankind, certainly not on a mass scale. Only select individuals in our police force have experienced this kind of deprivation. This is at a level which clearly reveals it is not just an individual thing, but rather a pervading and presenting influence which harasses the hearts of humanity. We fight against it, yet it comes through in drips and drabs of impatience or anger, feelings of inadequacy and insecurity, and times of resentment or even prejudice. These are scars as well, but they are ones which are not shown in the flesh, not evident physically. They are wounds of the soul. Our veterans carry these inner scars as well, on top of, or should I say, underneath these physical witnesses. But that is not all these veterans have experienced. 
they also have experienced the noble potential of humankind. They may have directly saved lives or fought beside those who gave their lives to save others. So many, fighting to stop war by stopping the aggressor, have come home with physical and inner scars from the wounds they incurred while valuing the lives of others. This characteristic is one we all like to imagine ourselves aspiring to, yet seldom have the opportunity to reach in peacetime. In apparent peacetime, most aren't willing to acknowledge we are still in a war, one which attempts to corrupt the spirit of humankind, crippled by the fall of man. We'd rather turn away to hide our shame than face the sense of inadequacy. It's understandable, because we don't even know where the war is being waged. It is the daily war of trying to rise up and live to protect the lives of others close by, and at a larger level, our society. It's not an outward war, however, it's a spiritual one. The victory starts by admitting we need the help of Christ, who has already fought that war and will share his scars with us if we ask him. In the sharing, he also shares the victory won, the victory over that inner harassment. No amount of cheerleading, reflective abandonment, or incessant distractions of multimedia can avoid the needful acknowledgement of life's calling us to yield to the witness of scars. Christ's sacrifice to defend us provided us with an opportunity to live forward with that same seed of integrity. But we must look at it honestly, remembering the corrupted heart of mankind from the fall in the garden. In the Bible it says, I will not forget you. Behold, I have engraven you on the palms of my hands. In Isaiah 49, 15b to 16a. God has scars. Think of it. We are his scars, and they remind him of his love for us. This seed of laying one's life down for others, and so society, is offered to us today. Remember, we must acknowledge the gift, purpose, and security with gratefulness. Christians hold this mission in heart. We have it because of the unending witness of Christ's scars. Scars serve as a piece of reality, evidence of truth fought for, and a danger fought against but defeated. In the judicial court system, throughout history, this is called evidence. But more than circumstantial or hearsay, it is an actual part of what existed in the fray. Christ's scars serve as a witness of the reality of the corruption of mankind. Yet more, they also serve as a testimony of a moment in time of God's victory over this corruption and how these scars offer direction for new life. Similarly, our veterans' scars direct us to look to them and learn of the value of life. Remembrance Day commemorates a needfulness to acknowledge the truth these heroes fought for, serves as a reminder to the spiritual war we live in today, and the good fight we can embrace to live as seeds of life. Happy Seasoning! Lindsay Remembrance Day ceremonies to look more normal this year. Dan Kearns, The Standard, Kawartha Lakes after a couple of years of COVID-19 protocols limiting what Lindsay's Legion can do on Remembrance Day, this year, the ceremonies on November 11th will look a lot more like they did in pre-pandemic years. The Remembrance Day parade will begin at Lindsay's Legion Branch 67 at 12 York Street North at 8.45 a.m. It will head down York Street, across Kent Street, down Russell Street, will cross William Street South, and will head to a 9 a.m. church service. At 10.05 a.m. following the service, the parade will resume down Russell Street to Cambridge Street South, and then north to Kent Street West, before finishing at the Cenotaph. The Legion estimates the parade will leave the Cenotaph around 11.30 a.m. and return to the Legion for dismissal. But, as Sir Sam Hughes Branch Public Relations Officer Bill Neville points out, there will be some new elements to this year's ceremonies. We are also, this year, celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Lindsay Cenotaph in our town. Another first in a long time is a church service on Remembrance Day. This year's service will be held at St. Paul's Anglican Church on Russell Street in Lindsay. Hopefully, we will have the service at different churches in the community in the future and for future years, he stated. The Legion is asking anyone who wishes to have a pre-laid wreath at the Cenotaph to contact their office at 705-324-2613. The Standard Podcast was produced by Greenstream Studio for the Standard Newspaper.